Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending our uh, complimentary webinar this morning um, on the overview of DOD, DOE, TNI state assessments. Uh, we're going to talk about accreditation requirements and some common findings. Uh, my name is Tracy Serzin. I will be presenting for the first portion of this uh, webinar presentation today. I'm going to talk a little bit about some assessment expectations, accreditation criteria for these particular programs. Uh, I don't have a lot of time to go into extensive detail, but what I wanted to do was just point out some differences between, between these programs. I also have uh, Julie Snelling, who is our Environmental Program Advisor and Lead Assessor, uh, who will be talking for the extent of the uh, webinar today on common nonconformities. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Ah, my mouse isn't. This is weird. What's going on? Okay. There you go. <laughs> okay. So, like I said, uh, the presentation overview, we're going to discuss briefly the accreditation criteria and expectations for some of these programs. And, and the reason why uh, I wanted to add a few slides to the bulk of, of Julie's presentation today is because we're starting to do. Uh, a lot more assessments with combinations of standards and programs. So for example, we have uh, DOD and DOE, that's that's pretty common and, and we've been doing those for years and have a pretty good handle on those because there's a lot of similarities between those. But what gets tricky is when it comes into uh, programs such as you know the state programs, plus the laboratories also want the DOD, DOE programs. So we'll be going over the differences uh, in regard to what you're expected to have available, um, also our assessment reporting and the corrective action process. And then Julie's gonna go over some overall common findings that we're seeing in the field. And, we're, and this is gonna be uh, specific to uh, DOD, DOE findings, but also TNI. So the state programs, as you know, uh, use the TNIEL standard. Uh, so this will be useful to anyone regardless of uh, you know what standard you're getting accredited to, whether you're just a state uh, state program or you have maybe a combination of all of them. We're going to have some time from questions and answers as well at the end. Okay, next slide. Just some webinar housekeeping. Uh, as you notice, everyone is muted at this time and will remain muted uh, for the entire series of the webinar. On your far right on your panel, you should have uh, you should see uh, a questions toolbar. So I ask that you type your questions in. Uh, if you have something that comes to mind, type it in right away, and we will be answering those at the end of the session the best we can. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website. Uh, there's a link there that shows you where to go shortly right after the, uh, the webinar is concluded. Next slide. Okay, so I just wanna dive right in into the current programs PGLA offers. Uh, for environmental programs, we have DOD ELAP and DOCAP using the QSM version 5.4 uh, that recently was released. So we have some laboratories that are transitioning over to that program. Um, some that have uh, particular uh, PFAS criteria are, are getting that uh, standard upgraded sooner than others, um, but we are doing assessments to that standard um, and some are receiving notations or observations from us on things that they need to modify uh, to meet that standard criteria. We offer TNI EL uh, individually on top of the state accreditation programs. I say TNI EL to NGAB, so non-governmental, so it doesn't confuse uh, laboratories that our accreditation program will necessarily be recognized to the reciprocity between TNI states. Um, some states that are not a TNI uh, have an AB in that state may recognize PGLA's accreditation, just depends on the state requirements. But for that program, we're using the, the latest TNI EL 2016 standard. We also offer a field sampling and measurement accreditation program standard. It's also TNI, it's called TNI NEFAP uh, FSMO Volume 1. We are uh, third-party assessors for Florida DOH and California ELAP and Minnesota. 
So we are third party assessors. So the difference between that is that we don't issue the accreditation. So we're hired and contracted to do the assessment only. So we're under the state requirements, uh, which is a little challenging for us. And it was it was difficult at first to get used to because we're not the necessarily the accreditation body. We're actually the assessor for their program. 17025 is still um, is our is the standard that we offer in general. Um, actually, a lot of our laboratories are accredited to that program particularly. Um, we do have some environmental laboratories that just get 17025 uh, for environmental programs and other things as well that is under that, that broad standard. And then we also offer what's called the EPA NLAP, which is the lead program. Okay, next slide. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, I'm going to primarily focus on uh, the state programs and DOD, DOE. Um, again, because we're having a lot of laboratories that utilize PGLA for their DOE or DOD accreditation, but also have, uh, for example, Florida DOH accreditation or, or now want California ELAP. So I wanted to point out a few things that's important for everyone to, to understand and to work with us on and to think about. So the first thing I want to talk about is accreditation criteria and schedules. So all programs require slightly different criteria in regard to their assessment schedules. So the important thing is for you as the laboratory with your state, if you have a contract with the state, is to keep on their schedule and their requirements, but also you have to meet our criteria. So all programs typically follow 1711, which is the ISO standard for accreditation bodies that require full system assessments to be performed every two years. But there are some state requirements that might have you, for example, uh, in order to schedule your renewal assessment, you have to submit an application process within so much time, or you have to go maybe six months before you expire. So there are things like that that we expect that the laboratory uh, do your due, due diligence and review on when you need to have your assessment by, so it's clearly communicated to us. Um, we do schedule 60 to 90 days out. Um, so for our programs, we have a good system that will flag your account to say, we need to be scheduling you by this time period so you can meet that, that uh, assessment due date and then your, so, so your certificate doesn't lapse. Um, but for the state programs, again, they might be different. So it's up to you to, to evaluate and to tell us that I need to have all these done within a certain time period. Now, for example, I know particularly with DOD and DOE, because we're doing combined assessments, they're not real keen on having their assessments moved. And actually, we're, we're really not allowed. We have to go every two years. So for example, if DOD, DOE is due in June, but your Florida is not due, due until August, and you want a combined assessment, you need to go in June. Extensions of accreditations, um, particularly for DOD and DOE, are no longer allowed unless there's a really strange circumstance that uh, they may allow you to extend your accreditation certificate. So again, we encourage all labs to, to review those due dates, coordinate with us so we can make sure that we can get everything you need within those particular timelines. Next slide. Okay, uh, accreditation criteria in regard to pre-documentation reviews. So no matter what program, since we're your assessor, we do require you to have uh, documentation sent to us 30 days in advance. So we need this information so we can ensure that you're ready for your assessment. We want, if you have a new assessor, we wanna get familiar with your laboratory, um, or you know, it gives you the opportunity for the assessor and you to have a conversation if there's anything that maybe they flagged as, you know, as a question or something they need prior to coming into your facility. If you're accredited with the state program, I do know this, that PTs are important to be completed ahead of time. Some of them require your fees to be paid with the state and some, and then application criteria as well every two years. So again, you know, just because PJLA only requires you have a contract with us for maybe DOD, DOE, you have your state obligations to supply them with your applications, your, your proficiency testings as they require. We really don't get involved with that. Um, the only way we get involved is when we tell them that you're scheduled for an assessment and they will inform us if there's missing PTs in their database or something has gone wrong and you haven't paid a fee or something with your applications. I know some states for renewals might not need that, some do. 
So we do have some line of communication once we schedule your assessment and inform them, but it's on you to supply your information to your state as required. In some states, they will also, uh, if you don't have your PTs in prior to the assessment, especially if you're expanding your scope of accreditation, they may not allow us to even assess those those tests or those particular analytes, and you might not be able to even um, get those until you come uh, until, until you have a scheduled a separate scope expansion. So just again, be careful. Make sure you have all that information, uh, you know, sent into your state. For DOE and DOD, we do have a email that we like you to send your PTs in. So if you're a new facility, this shouldn't be anything new for people that have been with us for a long time. But we do ask that the PT providers are informed um, to send all PTs to PT at pglabs.com. We do have a procedure on our website, our SOP1 accreditation procedure that specifies uh, you know, the email address and how we want the files sent in. This is so we can monitor your PTs as well uh, you know, after the assessment or you know, in between assessments. If we find that things are failing uh, on your PTs, we're gonna ask you about it. We possibly could take it off your scope. If it happens during the assessment, it also could be taken off your scope until we get passing results. Um, sometimes again, depending on the situation, we write the NCR and uh, the laboratory will, will uh, send in the, P the passing PT results and you know, then we move on. So it all depends on when we're seeing the failure happen. Prior to the assessment, this is a short list. Um, we do require assessors, I'm sorry, laboratories to provide LOD, LOQs, data packages, uh, PTs, technical SOPs, internal audits, past assessment results. Uh, we do have a list of things that we ask you to provide, and that has to be turned in uh, 30 days in advance. Next slide. Okay, so assessment reporting. Um, so every laboratory will get some type, some form of an assessment report after the assessment is completed. Uh, depending on the assessment, so if it's a single program or it could be a multiple standard, uh, laboratories may receive actually multiple reports. So for DOD, DOE, uh, and if, say we're doing a TNI ourselves, we do have a combined report for that. Uh, but they might have, uh, with your report, we also issue a list of nonconformities and they may be specific to those programs. So you might have NCRs related to DOD, some might say DOE, some might be just TNI, some might be 17025 if we're doing that as well. Uh, same thing with state programs. If we're issuing a report, non-conformance report for a state program, uh, we also will include specific citations to TNI EL, uh, state regulations. So Florida and California both have there are certain particular regulations or codes that we will write findings against. Uh, for state programs, we do issue a separate report though um, based on their requirements. So uh, for Florida, they do require their own uh, template that we issue a report on. California, we have our own internal uh, report that we issue that we've developed based on their requirements and the same with DOE and DOD. Okay. Next slide. So corrective action criteria is handled a little bit differently. So if it's PGLA's accreditation program, well, what I mean with that is PGLA issues the cert. So we are the accreditation body. So that would fall under DOD, DOE, TNIEL, 17025 programs that, again, we're the accreditation body for. If you're just using us as a third-party assessor for California ELAP and Florida DOH, for example, uh, that their criteria is a little bit different. The, again, the reports are different and their timelines for corrective action and what they expect is different. So for Florida, um, excuse me, for DOD, DOE, we will issue a final uh, report, uh, including an, a full assessment report, but also your findings. And we require that the assessors or the laboratories provide corrective action, including a cause um, and implement objective evidence showing you've implemented uh, what you've done for your corrective action within 60 days from the last day of the assessment. The Florida DOH, again, we use their uh, particular corrective action form. Uh, and labs uh, should provide a plan 30 days from the release of the final report. 
So with Florida DOH, we will give you a, at the end of the assessment, a summary of what your findings are. The report then comes to our office. We review it from the assessor, make any changes we might see, you know, any typos, grammar, or anything like that. Or if there's questions for the assessor, we'll ask them to, to clarify. And just think we want to make sure the findings are a finding. And we do that for DOE, DOE and DOD as well. Um, so you might also get a revised report um, in certain situations like that as well. Um, but not very often do we get uh, nonconformities really removed um, from the report you get from DOD, DOE. It's, it's more clerical things I think we find. Um, but for DOH, we will release, so PGLA actually is the one who releases your report. So then we will email the laboratories and state this is your final report and you have now have 30 days to provide a corrective action plan from the date that we release the final report. The same thing happens with uh, California ELAP. We will follow that same process. Once the corrective action is the corrective action plan is submitted in, we will review it and get back to you, letting you know that if it's been approved, if there's any issues, we will let you know. There are stipulations with California ELAP that we give you another 30 days to supply uh, a revised corrective action and failure after that to supply a sufficient corrective action actually will go to the state um, to handle and take over. But if everything goes smooth and the corrective action plan is approved, we do issue what's called a recommendation letter for both programs. So we issue a recommendation letter again because we're not the accrediting body. We're not the final decision maker. Those are up to, it's up to the state. So for Florida DOH, we issue the recommendation letter. They also get a copy of your final report and we include on the recommendation letter if there was corrective actions, when you supplied it, when we approved it, uh, you know what you're recommended for. Maybe you're not changing your scope, so to be, you know, recommended for renewal of your accreditation or to expand or, or to remove certain items off your scope of accreditation. So for both programs, we will do that. Um, for California ELAP, though, we only issue that to you, um, the recommendation letter but also we give you the checklist that we use to uh, during your assessment. So for Florida DOH, we copy contacts there at DOH, and at the same time, we send you the recommendation letter after we review the corrective action, and they, they do what they need with it. For California ELAP, we actually do not email anyone there unless there's some kind of problem or something during the assessment. It's up to the laboratory to supply uh, California with your application, your report and your checklist or anything else they would need from you. So we do not copy California ELAP on our final recommendation letter. Next slide. It's um, the next presentation. Yep. Okay, so uh, with that, that was just a brief uh, overview of the differences of the programs. Again, I can probably talk another 30 minutes on some of the other things that we're that we're seeing um, for these programs and some of the challenges, but I really wanted to spend the bulk of this webinar today um, and have Julie go over some common findings and and primarily because you know we're still seeing some new labs uh, pop up here for DoD or DOE, um, so this should uh, you know be a good overview to help you prepare for your assessment, but also for laboratories that are getting involved with the California ELAP program as well. Um, for years, they've, they've only followed the California regulations, now have to transition to the TNIEL standard. So we're, we're in hopes that uh, today with Julie's presentation, you'll be able to intake uh, some of the common findings that we're seeing uh, to help you prepare for your assessment. So with that, Julie, uh, welcome. Thank you for, for putting this together today, and I will turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, just a couple of things we kind of already talked about, but muting and everything like that. but just a couple notes. I do have pay slide numbers in the bottom right corner. So if you do have questions, I encourage you to kind of note down the slide number. So if I have to navigate back, I, I can do that. And I do tend to talk fast <laughs> and I apologize in advance. It's just the way I, I am. Um, and I also am not the type of person that just reads slides to people. So you'll notice if I have a slide, I'll have citations and stuff, but I'm not going to read them. I, I talk about them. So um, I encourage you to read the slides kind of as you listen to me talk, um, because I, I just don't read read slides to people. 
So just a warning about how I how I present and keeping up with with my speed. And again, just make sure you note the slide number if you have questions at the end. This presentation focuses mainly on the DoD and DOE QSM and also the TNI 2016 standard. However, as most of you know, if you're if you know the DoD DOE QSM, um, that is also based on the 17025 2005 standard, the 17025 2017 standard, and then this TNI 2009 standard. Um, so as I talk about these, there might be some sprinkled in 17025 2005 and 17 and 2009 TNI um, in there. And if you know the QSM, you'll understand that. Um, in addition, I have a few California ELAP regulations sprinkled in there, but not many. But if you see that, um, that's just for the California ELAP people. So for this presentation, the common findings I'm going to focus on are um, in module two of the both the TNI and the DOD DOE QSM for um, 4.2 is management, 4.3 is document control. 4.13, control of records, 4.14, internal audits, 5.4, environmental methods and method validations, and 5.5, calibration requirements. There are, are also common findings in both PTs and module two, two technical, but I decided to leave those out because PTs are pretty self-explanatory and technical is very lab dependent. And since this is, you know, many labs can be in here, I didn't want to focus on say organics if there's not an organic lab. So I focus more on the quality management system of common findings. So the first one I mentioned was 4.2 management. Um, there is requ many requirements sprinkled throughout all of the standards where the quality manual shall contain different information. Um, and one of them is that they have to have data review and, and audits and, and how that's done and procedures for it. Uh, also, the DOD DOE has additional requirements for data review that labs need to be careful of. Um, it requires a three-tier review, uh, and it describes what each tier shall contain and the percent of the review for each tier. And it also requires the quality manager or designee to review at least 10% of the data packages. So for those who are DOD, DOE, there's these additional requirements that um, have to be followed. And especially for labs that trans, transfer over, uh, they, they tend to miss these tiered and quality manager extra requirements. The quality manual also um, for the DOD, DOE needs to contain that when you're reviewing or doing audits, that there's an electronic audit trail function available. So when assessors are out there, we tend to ask um, the analysts to show us on their equipment, their, their monitors, um, that they have the electronic audit trail function enabled. For instruments that don't have that capability, then we need some sort of evidence that there is some sort of record of integrity of data. Um, so that kind of falls into the either the internal audit or the data review process, that there needs to be a procedure on how that's handled and, and that that is a requirement. In addition, um, there is a requirement about SOPs under 4.2 management that we have a lot of findings regarding accurate, that they accurately reflect all phases of the activities. Uh, I have this image of change on here because a lot of times what happens is there's what I call activity creep, either improvements that are done or corrective actions that are done, or maybe analysts just find better ways to do things, um, but it's not captured in the procedure. And so that results in a finding because as we're interviewing analysts out there, um, sometimes they're proud to show us what they changed, which is many times great, um, but it's not captured in the procedure to ensure that it's repeated if you know they win the lottery and leave. Um, so that's a common finding about the procedures not accurately reflecting what's going on. Doesn't mean what they're doing is is bad. It just means the procedure is not capturing it. So, and the more times we see that as an assessor, then we might start um, investigating whether SOP reviews are are um, effective because 
if it's been going on for a while, then whoever's reviewing the SOP may not be the right person to be re re reviewing it because they should be noticing that it's not accurately reflecting what they're doing. Um, also, we start to wonder if internal audits are effective because internal audits should be catching that information if it's been something that they've been doing for a while. So this might not just be a finding regarding um, the SOP, but it might add evidence of a potential that we don't think the SOP reviews are effective or the internal audits are effective. And it's just an example that we would provide as to why. Another thing under 4.2 management, um, this is where I just kind of mentioned California ELAP. I'm not going to go into it, but there are different requirements in the regulations where there's some quality manager requirements that we have um, quite often, probably more often than anything, um, that they're not being captured. And also some requirements about what needs to be in the quality manual that we frequently see um, findings for. So if you're California ELAP, you want to go through the regulations and if there's any sort of requirements that says the quality manual, manual shall contain or identify or, the, or any sort of training requirements that you have those captured somewhere. But again, I won't go deeply into them, but it does fall under this section where we have common findings. Now I'll go into document control 4.3. Um, there's a, we have a common findings regarding external sources, and external sources would be the standards, the TNI standard, the 17025 standard. If you're QSM, you need both versions of the 17025 standard, and you need the TNI 2009 standard for the DOD DOE QSM. Um, it also includes PGLA policies and procedures. Um, test methods and even equipment manuals. If your procedures refer to those equipment manuals, then they are actually a document in your management system that needs to be controlled. So we often have findings that um, the quality management system is not managing those external sources. There's also common findings that's related to that regarding maintaining a master list that um, contains the approved SOPs or documents in the quality management system and the current revision status. So some example of common findings might be um, that the, an SOP refers to an instrument manual so that you don't have to you know, regurgitate the manual, you just point to it. However, now that you've done that and it is now an instruction for the analyst, it becomes part of your controlled document program. So somehow that manual needs to be controlled and part of that master list. It might also, there's findings that PGLA policies or the TNI standard aren't part of the master document list or the quality management system. Um, of course, you know, things that are um, available outside, you have to be careful that you don't rely on it because it might not always be available for you. So you want to have it somewhere in your quality management system have the revision that you've verified your management system to, and then maybe annually go out there and see if it, there's a new revision, you know, to make sure your, your program's still compliant to the latest version of your external sources. Um, some documents don't have evidence of approval for use, so that needs to be very clear and, and documented. Um, it, there's no rule on how, but somehow the assessor needs to be able to see that it was approved for use. And it's not uncommon to get procedures that that there is no evidence of approval for use either through an electronic system or, or that it was signed. Many times the master list of documents is missing procedures. So during the assessment, the assessor gets some procedures and they're not part of that list or like we talked about the external sources that we talked about. Um, or the master list identifies obsolete procedures. So the assessor got, say they got revision seven and, and the master list still has revision six or five. Now, if it was just updated in the last month or so, you know, we're usually pretty, um, you know, we, we don't, if it's been a couple months or, you know, more than that, then we might do a finding. But if it's been recent, we understand it takes time to update things. But, but it is a common finding where they're just unrealistically not updated. Also under document control 4.3, the DOD has a requirement um, about 
operating operator aids or any documents providing instructions kind of falls under the same thing as we talked about external documents um, regarding items documents providing instructions but the operator aids are kind of another uh, definition of of documents where if you have something at the bench that the analyst is using to make decisions, then that has to be part of a controlled document system. It has to be approved, it has to have a revision, those kinds of things. So you make sure they're using the most current um, either specifications or, or instructions, and they have to be authorized um, for use. So some common findings that we see regarding that is that I already mentioned the instrument manual, um, but that falls under a document providing instructions. So I repeated it here. And then also, you know, we'll be in the facility and we'll see these operator aids. Um, the sample login is a common place where we might see it, but we'll see operator aids, but they're not controlled. They don't have a document control number. They don't have authorized for use, a revision number, or they're not on the master list. Also under document control 4.3, just some notes here, some differences between the TNI standard and the DOD QSM standard. The TNI standard has a requirement to periodically review, whereas the DOD, DOE standard actually says they have to be the technical SOPs. And when they mean technical, they, you know, anything that provides, you know, sample storage, sample receipt, sample preparation, it's not just the test method. Um, they shall be reviewed at least annually and then updated if necessary. So what's an acceptable um, frequency for TNI if they really don't provide a frequency? Well, um, more than three years is a little unrealistic. <laughs> I think three years is the longest I've seen. And that's usually from a mature lab that's been doing the same thing for quite a long time. But like I mentioned earlier about um, SOPs reflecting current activities, one of our questions will be, you know, do we have a lot of findings about that? You know, the SOPs don't reflect current activities or they haven't been updated to the current versions of standards and the standards have been around for, you know, more than a year um, or two years. So there's no requirement on, on what that would be, but if we start seeing things where we're finding the SOPs don't reflect the activities or other evidence, um, then we might have a finding that they weren't reviewed, you know, at a, a proper frequency because of all the findings. Also under document control 4.3 um, regarding periodically reviewed, you want to remember the requirement about external documents part being part of the quality management system. DOD DOE actually captures that and says reviews internal and external um, documentation shall be maintained but it also applies to TNI and 17025 because it did mention as I showed earlier that external documents shall be part of you know they're used um, to support activities shall be part of the quality management system so they also fall under that periodic review requirement um, you know, it might be just a minimal thing, like I talked about earlier, that you just check and make sure there's not no revisions. You know, that so if your quality management system has been verified to meet Rev 3 of some external document, either a PGLA policy or, or a test method or something, then you just show that you verified there's no new revisions out there. Um, but you need to capture something to show that you're confident and that, that you have the most current version of, of what you say you're being compliant to. So a common finding would be um, that not all procedures had evidence of biannual reviews, and that would be in accordance to the laboratory's SOP. If it was TNI, um, they chose biannual reviews, so we check and make sure they met that, try and, that biannual review. And again, this is another thing where if, you know, a lab is a month or even two months behind, you know, we're, we're not going to ding them on that. Um, it's more, you know, if they're six months, a year, if there's good evidence that they're just not meeting what they met um, required in their, their procedure. But we use, you know, common sense <laughs> regarding timing on that kind of stuff. Um, and then another one, which I talked about earlier, is the periodic review of external management system documentation. So 
like I said, just make sure you capture that you've verified at a minimum that there's been no changes in the revision of, of what you're pointing to so you can make sure your system is compliant to the most current version. Another common finding regarding reviews um, is that there's you want to make sure you understand there's a difference between reviewing the document and actually revising the document. So a lot of times we'll be at a lab and something hasn't been reviewed for six months, seven months, whatever the frequency, you know, whatever the tardiness is. And they say, oh, well, we, we need to update it. You know, we know we already know we need to update it. Well, capture the review separately. Um, so you can have a form or something where you say acceptable as is, revision required. Maybe you want to cancel it or somehow just put it aside, you know, because it's not being used right now. It's a test method that's not used often. And then comments. That way you capture that part of the process. You've captured that it's been reviewed and the results are that it might be need a revision and then you go to your revision process. And that will help avoid some of these revision findings, um, review findings, because then you have evidence you did review it, but you need to revise it. So again, um, just make sure you separate those two activities so you can capture the review, you've met that requirement, and then you go into your revision process. And then an example finding, um, well, there's a requirement about invalid and obsolete documents being properly removed. An example finding would be that we're, you know, it's not uncommon for us to be in the lab. Analysts like to print procedures so they can make notes. Um, but if they pull that out during the assessment, it's an old revision. Um, we might have a finding on that. A lot of labs try to get away with that by clearly identifying that, you know, any printed copies are uncontrolled copies. Um, and if you do that, then as long as we're confident they're not relying on on information that that could affect their testing, then you know it's fine. There's no NCR. But if they do have a procedure out there that doesn't mention that information, or or it seems like they don't realize there is a new version out there, then there might be an NCR. Another thing in document control um, that you just want to be aware of regarding SOPs is that there's a lot of requirements sprinkled throughout the document, both TNI, um, as I mentioned earlier, California ELAP, and the DOD QSM and the 17025 standards um, that say you shall have a written policy, you shall have a written SOP, you shall have a documented program. So be aware throughout all those standards um, where it says that, and it says it in different ways that you have to have some sort of documented um, either either procedure or something um, identifying how you comply to that requirement. So we do have findings where there's not a documented um, program for something or a written SOP for something. So um, be sure that you've gone through the standards and made sure that wherever it says you have to have something written or documented, that you do have that somewhere. Also under document control, we have common findings about documents not being uniquely identified, uh, the date of issue or revision, page numbering, it has to be clearly identified, the end of the document, you know, so we know we have all the pages um, and the issuing authority. So a lot of this happens um, with the operator aids that I talked about earlier, um, but also it does sometimes happen with SOPs and things like that that are either missing the page number or the certain re revision or other information like that. Um, uniquely identified, you know, you, if you don't have a rev with it, then if you make a new revision, then it's not uniquely identified if you're using the same ID, things like that. So you want to make sure that your documents comply with this 4.3.2.3. And one common finding, like I mentioned, is that um, the page numbering and issuing authorities aren't on those SOPs that the assessor receives. So now we're into control of records, which is 4.13. And one common finding is original observations. 
are not maintained. So what we mean by that is if we're out in the lab and the analyst walks through their process and they go over to balance and they kind of write down weights on a post-it note or they have some sort of piece of paper they write things on because it's for whatever reason, um, it's just easier for them to do that. That becomes the original observation and that has to be retained as a record. So you can't write things on a piece of paper or somewhere else that gets thrown away somewhere or thrown in a drawer that's not maintained as a record um, and then transfer it somewhere else. The original observation where it's written down shall be contained as the record. That also applies to correction factors on thermometers. So a common finding would be that um, there's a correction factor applied to the thermometer. The person observes maybe say they see a four degrees and the correction factor is one degree. So they write five degrees. Um, well, they have to write the original observation, which would be the four degrees, and then write the corrected temperature, which is five. So if you use correction factors, your record should show the observed temperature and then the corrected, fact, corrected temperature, because the observed temperature is the original observation. And that also helps you know that people are actually, rec what they're really recording, are they really applying the correction factor or not? 4.13 control of records. We also have, this is probably the most common finding we have. Um, it, it's almost every time I assess a lab um, and it's not, doesn't mean it's bad. It's it's just a hard one to, to maintain for, for a lab and make sure they capture everything. And that is that records have to, came, to contain all information to provide an audit trail, identify all factors affecting uncertainty, um, so that the process can be repeated. That's kind of what I talked about, the correction factor. You, you can, if you don't record the original observation, you're not sure if the person's recording that or not. So I always tell people when you look at a record and especially when you see a number, um, you wanna be able to answer the question, who, what, where, when, wh how, how would be you know, somewhere on there, what procedure are they following? Um, when is obviously the date, who, who did the activity, um, where probably isn't that important and why, but who, what, when, and how is the important things that the records should be showing. So some examples would be, we look at a record and there's a weight, but the, um, or there's a balance verification record, um, but it doesn't tell us what weight IDs they use to check that balance. Um, another one might be that there's a mo temperature monitoring record, but we don't know, we can't tell what thermometer was used to get that temperature. Um, lot numbers are you know, not on test records, and often we don't have the initials or some sort of identification of the per person performing that activity. I recently had one where they had them put it on the top of the page, but then there was 30 days of information on that page, and so it was a small lab, um, but there's the potential that you know someone else might do something on a different day. And so now you lost that traceability of who did it on that one day that the person was out that normally does it. So that's a very common finding that really pay attention to, and I'll, and I'll repeat it again, when you look at a record, and especially when you see a number, there might be instances where it's not a number and it's, this still applies, but mostly when you see a number, um, that has to do with uncertainty, you wanna be able to answer those questions. Who, what, when, where, and well, not where, but who, what, when, and why. Also control of records 4.13, there's requirements about, and this goes back to maintaining original observations we talked about earlier. When you make corrections, you wanna maintain that original um, information even if it's wrong you want you don't want to promote um obliterating data because that also kind of can promote fraud in instances that i've seen um, so you want to make sure everything's maintained even if it's not the right information so um in this instance they you know kind of obliterated the original result wrote the four um, but they lost that original observation so the requirement is to just you know really just do a little single line out to indicate 
you don't want that, but you can still see what it was. Do the new number, and then they should be signed or initialed. Another thing to consider now that people like to scan things and copy things is it has to be reproducible. So, you know, if someone changes something using a different um, ink color, they still need to follow the, the original requirement of a single line, you know, so you can make sure you can see the original result and do it like we, they did up here. Because when you copy it, you lose that ability for the eye to see the changes. So you want to consider things like that regarding original observations and making corrections. Also, um, the, the TNI, along with the DOD and DOE QSM, requires an access log to records. So when we assess the lab, we look to see where they archive their records and is there an access log, and we want to make sure people are keeping track of that. Um, and part of the record should be that you have a signature, initial and signature record. So when we're assessing, we might look at records and then ask for that log and see if we can tell who they are based on the log. And if we can't, then we might have an NCR that it's not traceable. And sometimes signatures and initials change with time. Um, so I've had a lab where I actually kind of have them do a, a sloppy initial and a you know, a careful initial. So you can tell the difference because people do have different initials based on whether or not they're in a hurry or not. Um, so we, you know, we want to make sure you have that signature log. So one of the common findings, like I mentioned, is that we'll look at records and um, the initials on the records weren't always traceable to that log. Also under control of records 4.13, um, there is a requirement that the laboratory has a plan um, to ensure that records are maintained and transferred if they go out of business or they change ownership. So just make sure you have this updated in your policies or your procedures or your quality manage manual if you have one um, and that you identify how that's going to be done. <clears throat> Also under control of records, notebooks are a common finding regarding either their page numbering, how they're closed out, that they have a unique ID. Um, the unique ID part can be lost if you make a new logbook with the same ID. So you want to make sure there's either a rev or some sort of difference if you keep the same ID. But um, there are many requirements with logbooks that you need to review both um, mainly the DOD DOE has more requirements than the TNI. Um, the TNI does have requirements, but the DOD DOE goes into more specification about what shall be done. Um, it also requires that the logbook can't be um, has to be bound and can't be you can't replace um, pages in it. So one of the common findings would be that. The laboratory is using a three ring binder, things like that. So you want to make sure it's bound so that pages can't be added or deleted. Um, and again, logbooks being, you know, being paginated so you can see the total number of pages or the unique ID is missing. So now with internal audits is the next category of common findings um, for internal audits. For the TNI, they do require that you address all elements of the management system, including testing and calibration activities. The DOD DOE goes a little further um, that you know they have to review all technical and quality system errors areas, but you also have to include raw electronic data files um, being reviewed, and then also sprinkled throughout. There's different areas. You want to be aware of in 4.15.1, it says management reviews and internal audits are separate activities. So we have had times where laboratories have tried to treat them as one, um, but for the DOD, DOE, QSM, that's not allowed. And then also there's different areas within the QSM that has additional things that you would want to add to the internal audit, for example, but not limited to. Um, for limbs, the QSM requires periodic inspections, at least annually. And so that means you're checking to make sure there haven't been um, attempts into your limbs, that you have 
it's backed up, um, that it's working correctly, and that might fall into this electronic data file review. You know, things like the passwords are being updated every six months, those thing kind of things. So these are just examples. There's more within in the TNI and the DoD QSM of different things that you want to be reviewing and, and inspecting that might fall under your internal audit program. So um, one of the common findings is that either the plan or the records did not address or include all testing activities. And that includes what I just talked about, limbs, um, it includes sample receipt, it includes all the methods on the scope, um, it includes training, did, did you evaluate record control? You know, did you go into where archives is and make sure people are using the log? Did you document control? Did you go out and make sure there's no obsolete revisions of documents out there or that you have some external documents that not, aren't on the document control list? Um, review of contracts, you know, pull some review of contracts, make sure they're meeting requirements. You know, it's all of the QSM that needs to be reviewed. And if we don't see evidence of it, then it's a finding. And so this is a common finding that we don't have evidence that all areas of the QSM is being audited. And now for environmental methods and method validation, the main finding for this is regarding modifications to methods. And um, so if there's any sort of simple, even a simple modification, this needs to be captured in the procedure and it also needs to be justified um, as to why that is good. And it usually needs some sort of method validation to show that it's an acceptable modification. Um, also in the DOD, DOE, QSM, in the various modules, um, there's a lot of ex extra method validation requirements. And um, I just I spelled that wrong. The 17025, there's a gray box in the QSM where you have to also follow the 17025 requirements, which has more requirements. So be aware if you're QSM, you have extra stuff and you actually also have to go refer to the 17025 standard. But regardless of the standard, there has to be, if there's a modification, you want to make sure you clearly identify it in the procedure and you justify it. And that's usually from a method validation. So again, a common finding would be method validations are not validated or documented in the SOP. And just as a, another discussion about that is laboratories, this is a huge risk for laboratories. So there was um, a 2 million settlement from a laboratory not long ago. And if you look at the problems they were doing, they really don't seem consequential, you know, not performing the required numbers of shakes, not waiting the required period of time between shakes. Um, you know, the spiking, that makes sense. Um, you know, some altering settings, that, you know, is important. Um, but, you know, these changes may have been insignificant really regarding the actual result. They might have made total sense and and not impacted results, but if they don't have it documented and they don't have it validated, um, the laboratory could end up in the same situation where they're not following their own procedures. So, so this is should give you a good warning of, of the significance of capturing any sort of modifications that are done and making sure they're justified and they're validated. Same environmental methods and method validation, 5.4. Um, there's common findings regarding spreadsheets, mainly that the formula cells are not right protected to minimize inadvertent changes, or they're not verified before initial use. They may have been verified, but there's no record available of it. So you want, want to make sure you capture that you verify them, not just that they're working the way you want them to, but that if something happens, that you want to do the opposite. So for example, you want to do negative numbers. Um, the greater than equal to is a common one because they just do less than signs, but the equal to. So if you happen to have that one instance where a number is right at something, you want to make sure it's working the way you expect it to be. So you want to test not only what it's supposed to do, but 
that if there's an odd out of the norm situation, like I said, a negative value are your absolutes. You know, did you put the absolute in the formula? Those kinds of things. So again, um, a common finding is that the verification records were not available for those spreadsheets or the formula cells were not right protected to protect those calculations that were verified. So now 5.5 calibration requirements. Um, there's requirements that equipment shall be capable of achieving the accuracy that's required and they shall be calibrated or verified bracketing the range of use. And this is both in the DOD, DOE QSM and the TNI. So some common findings and things you want to think about is the accuracy. Uh, I just recently had one where a thermometer accuracy, when I looked at the calibration report, it identified an accuracy of plus or minus one degrees Celsius, but it was used for uh, equipment with a requirement specification of plus or minus 0.2 or plus or minus 0.5. So obviously that accuracy of the thermometer really isn't fit for use for what it's being used for, because if you're looking for a plus or minus 0.2 or a plus or minus 0.5, an accuracy of one degree is more than double um, what your specification is. So this lab needs to get a thermometer with a, with a better um, accuracy. Also, we have frequent findings about equipment not being calibrated covering the range of use so you know balances you want to cover the range of use thermometers you want to cover the range of use um, anything that requires calibration this should go in your procurement documents you, you should specify to the calibration supplier what range of use you want calibrated and the reason I say that is not just common sense but um, I frequently have a finding regarding purchasing of thermometers. Um, so here you have uh, the catalog, um, catalog information where you're buying a thermometer and it has a range of minus 50 to 70 and maybe they're using this at minus 20 or they're gonna use it at 70. Um, but when you get it, it's only calibrated from zero to 50. And this is common because, and it's nothing bad, and that's why I didn't hide names or anything like that on this presentation, because it's not, it's nothing bad. Um, the supplier didn't do anything wrong because the people didn't specify what they needed. And when you go to these, either Fisher or VWR or, or whoever, um, you know, they have a warehouse and they kind of do hundreds and thousands of these. And so they just do it, calibrate covering the range that most people want it at. So there's usually a special order you have to do to get it at a, at a higher range covering its capability. So this is a common one for me um, because it's, it's an innocent mistake, but your procurement document needs to identify what you need it calibrated at so you can make sure you get it at the range you need. And you might need to call the person and say, what do I need to do to make sure that I get this? And I have three calibration points, not just two, you know, things like that. So you need to pay really attention to the range of use um, requirement for equipment. Under 5.5 calibration requirements, a uh, common requirement and uh, finding is about equipment complying to specifications. Um, so for example, here there's a specification, that I think this was a refrigerator, that it needed to be from zero to six. Um, but when I looked at all the results, they were outside of it. And you might chuckle at this, but I run across this a lot. Um, I always, if I don't see a specification here, um, I always try to encourage labs to put it here because a lot of times when I see things out of spec, um, it's not on the form. And so I encourage people at least communicate it, you know, on the form to people so you can give that chance of them remembering what it is. But here it was actually there and it was still out of specification so you know internal audits need to be checking this information you know if I saw a lot of this then I would start wondering if the internal audit was effective um, but anyways this is a good example of you know making sure not just writing a number down but making sure it 
actually met specification. This could have been, I mean, these numbers are pretty off, but if they were maybe only off by one, was this that they were applying a correction factor or they weren't applying a correction factor and maybe, you know, if it was minus two correction factors, some of these are actually in. So um, a lot of things to think about when you're checking equipment for specification and that your records actually show that they're within specification. Also under calibration requirements, a common finding is that there'll be something out of spec like the one I just showed you. I would expect to see some sort of documentation that an evaluation of the impact of that out of spec condition was evaluated. It may not fall into non-conforming work and corrective action. Um, for example, that one, if it was a corrective correction factor issue or Maybe the refrigerator wasn't used during that time. It was being, you know, I don't want to say defrosted because the temperature would be worse, but um, maybe it was just being used for something else at that time. You would at least want to document that. Um, so anytime there's something out of spec, it needs to be examined and documented as to why um, it either does not impact data, why it's okay. Um, if it does, then potentially impact data, then it would go into your non-conforming program and you would capture whether or not data was impacted, whether you're not, you need to re revise reports, um, notify clients, those kinds of things. So that falls under the decision to take, uh, is taken on acceptability, um, which is in the 17025, 2017, it's clearly documented, but even in just the TNI, um, it says an evaluation of significance. So you want to evaluate the impact. So for example, here's a weight set which had some out of tolerance specifications. Um, the calibration supplier said, hey, these were out of tolerance as found. We cleaned them, we put them back in spec, they're all good now. Um, but the laboratory needs to document whether or not this is okay or not. Sometimes it is. Sometimes the spec that the calibration supplier used is more, far more strict than the laboratory. So that's as simple as putting a note down here saying tolerance meets SOP, blah, 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 and your initials and dates. Um, therefore, no, no action required. Um, or maybe those weights weren't even used. So you would put a note. These weights were not used since the last calibration. No impact. So initials, date. But if it, those weights were used and those weights and these results don't meet your tolerance, then you need to go to your non-conforming process to evaluate whether or not data was impacted. Same here, just another example um, where this one was quite out. Um, as you can see, it was supposed to be um, 0.01 and they found it at 0.0. Five. So in this lab, there was a few others kind of like this where I started wondering about how they were handling their equipment um, because actually I didn't put that image here, but one of the um, notes from the calibration supplier said that the weight was bent and they had to unbend it. So there was some serious handling questions with this lab. Um, so as we see out of, out, of, out of tolerance conditions, then we start kind of wondering about handling of equipment if we start seeing it a lot. But this is just another example where I should have seen some sort of evidence. It does, you know, it can be as easy as writing it on the report or it can be under another form. There's no rule on how you capture it, but the assessor will request evidence that this was evaluated for significance some sort of justification is why it's a no never mind or or an NCR or corrective action or something in place to evaluate whether or not data was impacted. Here's another example that I had recently um, that the temperature was supposed to be 121 and the as found was 10 and the as left was found 10. This is a catastrophic failure of equipment and I'm not exaggerating that this lab had a 2020 calibration report that said the same thing, and then the 2021 report. So they didn't even look at the report. And I get that a lot where there'll be an out of tolerance condition, and the lab would say, well, they're supposed to tell me 
I, I'm like, they did on the report. Well, they're supposed to fix it. And sometimes they did fix it. This instance, they didn't. But you are responsible to look at this, these reports and see whether or not the as-found condition was acceptable, how the as-left condition is for your project, because the calibration supplier might not have used the same tolerances that you use. You know, you need to communicate in your procurement documents where you need it checked at and what tolerances you want. Um, but this is a good example of, you know, looking at the calibration reports, if there's out of tolerance conditions, evaluate significance, and then if there's significance to it that may potentially impact data, then you need to go into your non-conforming process. And this is a common finding. Also under calibration requirements, um, when we talked about examining effective results, um, evaluation of significance, making a decision on acceptability, the kind of questions you might ask yourself, is it, you know, did it meet your tolerance? Like I said, calibration suppliers sometimes have tighter tolerances than your lab. So if they used a plus or minus 0.1, but yours is plus or minus one, and it was within yours, then you just note that. And, you know, I usually refer to the SOP also to show or put what the tolerance is. Um, Maybe you didn't use it at that range, but be careful if it was out at, say it was a balance and it was measured at 10, 20, 60, and 100, and it was out at 60, um, then you can't have used it above 20. Whatever the last passing point was is what the range you can't have used it at as your justification. And then also sometimes equipment is indication only, but your process should show that. I'll talk later about labeling. But if it wasn't used for quality affecting purposes, then you, you justify that and it doesn't not go into your corrective action process because there's no reason to believe data was impacted. Also under calibration requirements, there's a requirement about sort of a software inventory list of some sorts. Um, I mean, equipment inventory list. And one of the common findings is the software part of it. Uh, you need to keep track of the software version so that if there's updates, you do another validation that there hasn't been impact to either your limbs or how you do things. Sometimes software updates and equipment overrides um, control limits that you have in there. So if you had a 75 to 125 percent limit in there for it at flag, you need to check those to make sure they weren't overridden. Um, also, how it communicates with your limbs and even communicates with other peripheral equipment that you have in there like sample auto samplers and stuff like that so you want to be able to keep track of the version so that you can make sure you validated it when it or verified it when it when it's installed so some of the findings regarding the list of equipment is like i said software versions were not identified or were not current if it's not, if it's not current then we're also looking for the verification of that current revision that we noticed in the in the lab um, sometimes it's just missing equipment, you know, labs buy new equipment and, and they don't put it on there. Um, or also labs sometimes use model numbers as a unique ID, but technically it's really not a unique ID. And although sometimes it's not probable, um, it's possible to buy, especially thermometers, the same model numbers. So a unique ID is really a serial number or an asset number. Also for calibration requirements, there's safe handling, storage, um, maintenance. Uh, there should, and it says they shall have procedures for this. So like I mentioned earlier on in the presentation, there's a lot of stuff in here where you have to have a procedure for something. So you want a procedure for that. Um, and then the calibration program in 17025 clarifies that it should be reviewed and adjusted as necessary. It's implied here regarding a plan maintenance, but it's a little bit more clear here regarding, you know, evaluating whether or not your calibration frequency is acceptable for what you're using it for. So for an example, um, there was a finding I had where I was reviewing calibration reports and they were for weights. And I reviewed a couple of different cycles of calibration reports and all of them had said they were out of tolerance and they were dirty and they were clean. Um, so to me, that was a trend that there was a handling issue, but also maybe the five-year calibration interval wasn't 
good enough. If they're having a handling issue that they can't control, then they need to tighten up the calibration interval so they're not constantly having out of tolerance conditions. Um, maybe they need to do it every year or every two years if they can't fix the handling. Um, you know, in rad area, in glove boxes, we have to calibrate every six months <laughs> um, because the radiation just destroys things. Um, also, for um, another example I had, I, you know, they had this flow unit that had a four-year calibration interval, and I looked at the last three calibrations, and they were all out of tolerance. So, um, one, they're potentially at adequacy of handling, but in this instance, this thing was sit in the corner of the room, not really touched much. Um, so is it really a handling or is it really that they just needed to increase the interval because that equipment just tends to go out? So when we talk about reviewed and adjusted as necessary in a planned maintenance, you want to be evaluating it. If you're finding a lot of as found out of tolerance, then that's indication that your interval needs to be adjusted or you need, you need to evaluate its use and handling. Another finding might be that there's equipment out in the lab that we see that they're either the calibration is expired or um, it's not labeled at all. Uh, the control company labels that you get on thermometers, I see those a lot because they put a cal due date on it and then um, they're not removed when that's, when that's done. So you want to make sure those are removed and it's clearly identified what the current due date is, however you're, whether you're verifying or having it recalibrated. Um, but anyways, sometimes when we see this equipment, they'll say, oh, we don't use it for quality purposes. Um, or when we look at calibration reports or verification records, we see that it was maybe not working at a certain range, so they put a note to only use it at you know, an approved range. Well, that needs to be clearly identified on the equipment to prevent inadvertent use. So an example finding might be that a thermometer was observed without a label. You know, Although people clearly, and I was confident in what they said, um, indicated it was not used for quality purposes, it needed to be labeled to prevent that inadvertent use. So that's the calibration status is that is not calibrated, so don't use it as calibrated equipment. Also under calibration requirements, um, laboratories shall retain records for everything. A common finding is that this, they don't have the record in their system because it's available online, but that does not meet the requirement because you don't have control on the retention and availability of that record. So if there's a certificate of analysis that's on a website, you want to download it, review it for adequacy, and then store it in your own system. Same as when you're reviewing a supplier and they're accredited, you pull that accreditation down from the system and you put it in your records because you need to control them. Also under calibration records and retaining, um, retaining those records, I kind of mentioned about reviewing them for adequacy. There is a requirement that they need to be inspected, that they comply with requirements. So that falls under what I talked about, the out of tolerance conditions. But it also talks, you know, you want to look and make sure it meets what you want. Um, does it say if your program says you're tr you have records that are traceable to the SI via NIST, you want to make sure that record has a statement in there that it's traceable to the SI via NIST. Um, believe it or not, I have a lot of findings where they don't say that, so they don't have that traceability. Um, so these are some extreme examples, but here's one where I was at a lab assessing it, um, and this document. I'm not kidding, Made said that um, this is issued without a signature and they don't um, have any rely responsibility in, in the use of it. Basically, they don't stand by it. Um, so when you receive information, someone needs to be responsible to be looking at this. It also didn't mention traceability in some sort, but it was a turbidity. But um, you want to make sure it's the specification you want, has the accuracy you want, is if it was 40, did you order a thousand, um, you know, all that information and, and that it doesn't say something like this. So this would be not meeting requirements regarding traceability, but this would also meet, be a finding about not reviewing um, procured documents, you know, for adequacy upon receipt.
Here's another example where it was a calibration report um, and the statement at the top said, um, this does not provide traceability, is not suitable for quality or regulatory requirements. This was found at a, a great lab. They really knew what they were doing. Um, they had a great program, but they had ordered from this company many times, but they clicked the wrong box, which I'll talk about later regarding the type of calibration. And when they got the report, it was a nice, pretty report with this pretty border from an accredited company. Um, but it was the wrong level of calibration and they didn't notice it because they didn't do a thorough review when they received it. So you wanna be looking at this information. And if it's calibration, did they calibrate covering your range of use? So just a few things about calibration, some differences, TNI um, says temperature measuring devices shall be calibrated or verified at least annually, but the QSM requires um, liquid in glass annually, but electric to be electronic to be quarterly. So just be aware of those differences when you're um, using different standards. And also if you're accredited, there's the PGLA policy too has different requirements within it regarding traceability um, and also measurement uncertainty and under another policy. Um, it requires you to use an accredited provider for calibration or an NMI. And there's other things, I'm just um, paraphrasing and putting some examples here, but there's other ways, but then you have to go through this approval process and then you have to follow that process because sometimes labs get approval to use a certain supplier, but we have requirements about getting traceability information. And then we come in and assess them again and they had it recalibrated since then they forgot. So um, there are requirements for calibration if you're accredited. And again, I mentioned earlier about correction factors um, and tolerances. Um, one thing about correction factors is often I see thermometers being calibrated or verified, and then they just apply a correction factor. But you have to have in your program what's an acceptable change in correction factors. So if you have a thermometer in use and you go through your annual verification and your correction factor was zero last time, and this time it's 1.5 is is that acceptable do you need to go back and see whether or not data was impacted um, since the last verification you know if it was off by 1.5 you don't know when it was off by 1.5 which then goes to the frequency like if you keep having that problem with that thermometer you might want to check it more often so you can get a better idea of, of what data was impacted but if you're using correction factors you're really don't just apply a correction factor every time you see what the change was and whether you need to evaluate significance of that change. So that might be a finding where, you know, a correction factor changed by a significant amount and um, there was no evaluation of, of whether or not there was an impact to that. And usually the finding would point to like the example I gave before about if it's used at plus or minus 0.5 and the tolerance changed by one, um, we would point to that as part of the finding. And again, we, we talked earlier about observed and corrected temp. You know, you wanna make sure if you are using corrected temperature, correction factors that you're identifying both when you're recording them. Another requirement difference for pipettes, TNI requires it quarterly and just at the midpoint, whereas DOD requires it daily before use and it goes further regarding replicate measurements and a mean of plus or minus two and an RSD of less than or equal to one um, and bracketing the range of use. So TNI is midpoint, QSM is bracketing and then it also goes further into replicate measurements and different um, statistical evaluations and it's daily. Syringes, uh, TNI has an ex exception that you for all other equipment that syringes might fall under that they're inspected, um, but QSM actually requires a certificate of bias and precision. So you want to make sure you have that certificate. Hamilton has something on the website where you can just pull that and keep it as a record, um, but you want that bias and precision information for your syringes. Also, TNI um, for balances, they want each day of use um, 
but QSM goes further about what kind of balance you're using and the criteria, and it requires an actual 17025 accredited calibration, which I talked about earlier that accrediting bodies also require that, not just PGLA for any calibration. And for weight, same thing. Um, TNI just requires it to be traceable, but uh, QSM requires it to be five years and to be an accredited calibration. And TNI doesn't mention how often um, or there annually uh, weights would fall under the annually for um, TNI. And again, I mentioned the policy two, PGLA policy two has this requirement about using an accredited provider. Um, one common finding I have is that you go to accredited a plot provider, but you don't get an accredited calibration. Um, I kind of talked about that earlier and I'll go into that more further now. Um, so PGLA policy three and every accrediting body has something similar to this that if you're providing an accredited report, there's a way that you have to say that it's accredited because you might notice non-accredited companies might have statements like that they comply to, um, they maintain a system accredited to, but that doesn't mean it's accredited report. And I'll show you a little earlier, later, um, but they should be saying something like this. Um, actually, this is also not compliant, which I'll talk about later. So a company can be accredited, but you might not get an accredited calibration report. And so you wanna be aware that accrediting bodies require, they say the standard, they say who they're accredited to, they say that what their accreditation number is, and they say they feel their field of accreditation because they wanna make it clear so you can tell the distinction between a non-accredited report and an accredited report, either whether it's from a non-accredited company or an accredited company. So when you go to a accredited company, you usually have choices. You can get just a basic certificate, um, which like that one I showed you before, it was from an accredited company, but it said this is not to be used for quality purposes. You can get NIST traceable reports. You can get just a report with data, or you can get an accredited report, or you can get a non-accredited report. So there's many different reports you can get, and they're usually different prices. And so if your procurement person orders the wrong one, you're not going to get what you're you need to be compliant. And some just excerpt some reports from accredited companies. Um, this one says they're accredited 17025. A lot of people when they see that, they consider that as meeting the needs. But like what I showed you earlier, that doesn't always mean it's an accredited report. This company is actually really good that they say unless we um, unless we use the logo, then this is not an accredited report. And this report that I took this from did not have the logo. And the lab was surprised because they're like, but they're accredited. So, and here's just another example where they say, um, the customer request and report is not considered an accredited calibration. So this was an accredited company, but because the customer requested a different, or they did not request a calibration accredited report. So either they chose the wrong, um, choice or for some reason calibration suppliers always default to non-accredited and I don't know why and they don't ask so if you don't tell them they might just not do it so um, here's another one that just accredited calibration they say they they're 17025 accredited they meet requirements of 17025 but these are not accredited reports so again like I mentioned earlier these statements on a calibration report do not mean it's an accredited calibration report and the standard requires the 17 the DOD DOE standard requires an accredited report and the PGLA SOP requires um, or that policy that I showed you earlier requires an accredited report so you want to make sure you're looking for that because that's a common finding that we have calibration reports that are not accredited for traceability to how they approve the supplier which is accreditation. So when you're approving suppliers, um, I'm just gonna focus on calibration suppliers because um, that's the most common finding. If they're accredited calibration supplier, you're responsible to pull down their accreditation scope and keep it in your records. You don't rely on their website because their scope will change and so you won't have the old one as you know how that works. Um, 
You will want to make sure that your purchase documents communicate that you want an ISO 17025 accredited calibration report so you can protect yourself and make sure you're clearly communicating. So if you don't get that, you have at least some sort of ability to get what you want without paying more for it. Um, and when you get it, you need to review it and make sure it meets your requirements that it was a credited report. It does cover your your um, range of use. It wasn't out of tolerance for you to evaluate significance and possibly do a corrective action. So one of the common findings is that, you know, although they had calibration reports and they went through accredited company and they evaluated that supplier to be accredited, they did not receive an accredited report for traceability to that quality program. So that was, I know I went through it fast, but those were the most common findings. Um, before I go through the questions, um, I'll just talk one. There's some resources both on the TNI and the DoD EDQW websites. They provide guidance documents, interpretation requests that you can actually even be um, notified if there's new ones. So I highly recommend that, even if you're not TNI, um, they're really good interpretation questions. Um, there's also training available. PGLA's website, their resources um, section has uh, documents in it. And for this training, SOP1 general applies, the DoD ELAP SOP1 applies, the TNI EL, but I also talked about different policies and SOPs. Um, and of course, the webinars, as you know, um, are available and they're free. And there's also past webinars. So there's some out there that I listed here that are kind of good. There's an internal audit one, common, another common findings for just 17025, impartiality and confidentiality, um, if you're interested in any of those. Um, is there any questions? All right, thanks, Julie. Um, we do have a few questions that came up. Um, so I appreciate your presentation. It's very thorough. Again, this will be on our website uh, shortly after the, this concludes today. Uh, one question we have is if a laboratory transitions from a hard copy system for the records and go electronic, are they required to keep those hard copy records? So I always tell a lab, if you're gonna go to electronic and you're gonna be scanning hard copy records, you want a procedure or something that captures how you verify that that electronic record is complete before you get rid of the hard copy record. And what I mean by that is like I talked about earlier when you reproduce something, was there different colored ink that now you lost on the scan? Um, green highlights, any highlight other than yellow kind can obliterate um, data if you, depending on your scanner. Um, people don't scan the back page. If people wrote really far into the margin, some scanners don't catch that. Um, sometimes if you're using a sheet feeder, it skips pages. So if you're going to scan and get rid of that and consider the, heart, the electronic record the record, one, you want to get rid of the old record so that if there's any changes to it they're not changing the hard copy record and not the electronic record right but also that that electronic record is 1000 percent complete and you didn't lose any information either by resolution um highlighting changes in um, ink um and so you want a procedure for that you know a bulleted list a checklist of things to look for before you you capture that as your electronic record Is that it? No other questions? And then the next webinar will be Thursday, June 30th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, they're looking at 6.5 evaluation and measurement uncertainty um, requirements and fundamentals. And then um, if you have any questions, you can contact Tracy or me at the emails on the slide. And there's no more questions. Thank you for joining us and I hope it was helpful. Thank you, Julie. Thanks, Julie. Okay, have a good rest of the week.